Okay, great. Well, we'll get we'll get going, and other people may uh, may join as we go. So, uh, thank you all for joining on uh, on behalf of Corona Y for this uh, conversation with Professor Agnes Stab uh, on how we best fight COVID nineteen through data. So, I'll tell a little bit about uh, about who Corona Y is and, and who Professor Stab is, and then we'll uh, we'll dive in from there. So, Professor Stab uh, is the founder of uh, Transforms Me. Um, and started, among many other things, started the uh, MIT uh, lab's research on persuasive cities. He's a three times TEDx speaker um, and has areas of focus that include sustainable behavior and uh, demystifying artificial intelligence. He's also the leader of the Transformative Technology Labs uh, chapter in Paris. So uh, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us, uh, Professor Stive. I'll quickly say for Corona Y, our mission is to mobilize volunteers and community partners to address the world's biggest challenges through data science, artificial intelligence, and knowledge sharing. Our focus is the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, and our current primary task is writing artificial intelligence to assist COVID-19 researchers to find the scholarly articles most relevant to their work. In a second, I'll introduce Tess Geo. I'll just share quickly, um, we were thrilled to find out our preliminary findings. They're still not vetted fully, um, but we had an epidemiologist look over the work and say that it was helping him take what would be a month's worth of research in the articles and to turn that into a day's worth of research and help him validate whether his research was worth pursuing. So it's really, it's thrilling seeing what's beginning to, to come out of this. Um, and I'll introduce most of our work has to do with natural language processing. Uh, but we have a team that underlies all of that work, which is our task geo team, and they explore how geographic factors affect virality. Uh, so I'm going to turn things over to, to that team and they can they'll explain a little bit of what we do. Right. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Then um, is one in the call already? Because he has the slides. He does. I don't see him here yet. Well, yeah, let me, maybe. Is he just now? joined now. Oh, okay, okay, good. Hi. Hi, Juan, can you bring up the slides? Uh, yeah, of course, one second. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Juan. Okay. Okay, you see the screen? Right. Yeah, yes, yes, good. Yeah. Right, so um, as Daniel mentioned, so one of the main focuses of Corona Y is NLP at the moment. Um, we are approaching um, the problem in a slightly different way. So the idea is there's a lot of risk factors that are, that are geog geography related. It could be uh, population density can be an impact on how fast the virus spreads, or it could be some um, demographic data or some meteorological data that has an impact on mortality, on, uh, on spread of the virus and so on. And um, well, the goal of, uh, of our team is to provide tools that can help us understand uh, how those geographic factors uh, impact the spread and mortality of the virus. So one thing on which I, I want to be um, quite clear from the start, right now, uh, we do not aim at uh, drawing any conclusions. We want to provide uh, the tools to help experts to do this work. Uh, this because we are not experts in epidemiology, we are not virologists, and uh, we don't want to do a bad analysis that then turns out to be harmful in the end. Uh, so one of our big goals um, currently is to source and bring into a centralized database um, this kind of data to put it at the disposal of uh, 
the public and of researchers and so on. So we want to do this in a standardized format, in a ready to use, a ready to use form. Um, because right now there's a lot of available data around on the internet or wherever, uh, but uh, usually it requires some work to find it, some work to understand where it comes from, if it's reliable, and uh, also if we want to use more than one data source, then it can be uh, quite a bit of work to just bring them into a form that uh, um, allows us to just, you know, even just merge two tables. So this is um, one of our main focuses right now. And uh, now I think um, Juan can share a bit uh, of uh, about uh, what we're doing with this data, in particular uh, from the point of view of data visualization uh, in our teams. Okay, great. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, well, first, uh, we have in mind these three stages, okay, like we are in a first stage where we are constructing uh, a public warehouse. We are like uh, with a lot of incredible people constructing uh, uh, an, an amazing place where we are uh, getting, putting all the data related with EO and, and coronavirus. Uh, and having that in mind, right now we are like uh, starting to define a, a exploratory, exploratory methodology. So uh, right now, I just in three five minutes, I want to give like a small build of information to that will summarize what what I mean with this exploratory methodology. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to to have in mind what we understand with methodology. Uh, when we talk about methodology, what it comes to our minds is to have a method, uh, which means in, in a way like controlling or, or, or having a set of tools and strategies that permit uh, achieving a precise goal. Uh, using like uh, a logical or a, an, an order procedure that may synthesize and, 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 and understand a challenging complex, complexity. Uh, that at first sight uh, may seem out of grasp. Uh, so uh, having in mind these two funny pictures, right? Uh, uh, the purpose of, 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 of what we want to achieve with your data is to give order and sense to, to this data. So uh, we, can, we are working in, in, in like, given three areas to this methodology. The first one would be data scale, granular aggregated data. What uh, we mean with this is like going from general to particular, uh, like getting the big picture, understanding the parts, uh, how the global results are constructed from, from granular data. Then we'll be filtering and weighting data. Uh, the aim is, um, as the name itself is, um, indicates, is to filter and weight data, so we can detect which which is the most valuable uh, data in order to to understand how the virus spreads. Uh, we need to understand the pieces or, or how they work with each other, with each other, and what is the value and measure they have. And the last one would be like uh, overlaying the, the data, uh, like having different kind of layers of information so we can better inform the, the experts, as, as Daniel said previously. Uh, what conclusions, what different angle of view we can achieve with different combinations of, of these layers. Uh, okay, so just a small uh, piece of the work we are developing, if my computer permits this. Okay. It's a snapshot of one tool of uh, how in, in the global scale we are analyzing data, how we go deeper in, in, a, in a near scale, or in this case Italy, that is uh, the country that we are centering our efforts uh, right now, and a more local or, or regional scale. Okay. Uh, 
yeah, we are more or less like uh, the brainstorming of how we think, how, what tools, what, what widgets, what graphs, what kind of visual uh, resources we have in, in, in uh, we have to uh, create the, the best um, yeah, tools for, for the expert. Um, and just for finishing, uh, I'm, I'm bearing in mind uh, this uh, and, and the fantastic opportunity that is having this call, uh, stage three. Uh, what, what we want in this stage is, is, is to share and receive feedback from the experts for the two previous stages. Uh, so we can help uh, to, uh, to combat and deal, and deal with, with this uh, global situation we are living. Okay, so more or less, yeah, that's it. Yeah, thanks, Juan. Thanks so much. Okay, let's see if I can stop sharing the screen now. <laughs> and I'll mention that also right now, all of our main task teams um, are in the final day's push of a more than two week crunch to get an initial set of tools and sort of presentation submission uh, out. Uh, so uh, we're, we're uh, pleased that you all can take the time away from that work that you've been, been, been pushing on so hard to do that. Um, I'm just going to quickly share the um, next question that we have. So, so I had the, the good fortune to meet Professor Stibe and to hear a workshop of his at last year's transformation Transformational Technology Labs conference. Um, and because of your expertise uh, around smart cities and, and how you can take the data that exists and move that over um, and turn that into actual behavior uh, change, uh, we wanted to ask some, some key questions to you. So the first question that I wanted to ask was, what data sources would you suggest can best help us understand the COVID-19 situation from a civic and a municipal angle uh, and how? And feel free to give also, I, I forgot there, to, to give you a chance to give a little bit more introduction to yourself and your work as well. That was important piece that we completely forgot. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, no worries. Um, basically, you already gave the general um, key points of what I have done so far. But just to give a sense of where I am right now is about demystifying human transformation and actually tapping into how individuals can uh, take control over their um, success in whatever change or transformation they want to achieve. And because I initially started to work on transforming cities, which means like scaling it up, but then I realized the best way to use or to ignite this um, like the movement of transformation is also to enable and empower every single individual to have a simple ways to start the change and understand the change and make it uh, work. So maybe one question before I start answering the questions is, uh, I learned that you predominantly use the NLP. It's not the <laughs> neuro linguistic programming that is natural language processing is and then you pro provided these insights into how you geo localize the data using the example of Italy and I'm just curious whether you really use that language processing on the freely available textual data that is uh, available online is that the case most likely you might use also some other techniques of what particularly you've been using to, to create those um, um, graphical images that you presented. Could somebody just give me a little bit more insight before I start? Yeah, of and course. Maybe, oh, yeah, please go ahead. Doctor. Maybe I'll give a, a quick like non-technical explanation in terms of what is actually happening. There is a big chunk of work that is uh, happening with us working with the CORD-19 uh, data set, which is the 47,000 of scientific papers that we're trying to extract um, relevant information for research community. That's kind of the NLP part of it. The other piece that is being baked uh, by the GEO team is basically an attempt to create this unique infrastructure to support all kinds of insights 
from various sources, from U.S. Census data, from other U.N. Uh, data sources and other pieces. So you can see that as, a, as two kind of separate tracks that are converging as we are approaching this, you know, Kaggle submission or like something to showcase to research community. Does that answer think, your question? Yes, and I have like just a little bit additional question to, pre to, to make it more precise. Have you done anything with uh, like textual data on the social media? We haven't yet, except there are individuals that joined our community that are doing it in various ways. To give you an example, there is a task force that is working on fighting disinformation in terms of COVID-19 and identifying false claims. And they're building a platform to support that. Right. And uh, maybe the very final one <laughs> is about have any, any of your effort been targeted to figure out the behavioral patterns from the data that you have looked at so far? Yeah, so we're kind of taking this approach of the fact that we should not be the people to synthesize any insights or produce any claims. As Daniel mentioned, that could be very harmful and very dangerous if you know used by different uh, malicious actors. So what we're trying to accomplish and what we're accomplishing right now is a rapid prototyping of a tool to help subject matter experts connect the dots and produce these conclusions. So we have physicians, we have epidemiologists in our community that are jumping in and figuring out how to best uh, fit in, which is a challenge because we're dealing with multi-cultural, um, cross-disciplinary, across the globe type of collaboration, which is a very, very hard thing to, to accomplish. Great. Thank you. Now I got the enough understanding of what you've been doing and what's your, what your aims are so that I would be able to at least tie into, into your current work a little bit of insights from my uh, scientific and practical work that might actually be resonating with what you want to achieve. So why I asked this question about the behavioral patterns, it's exactly I would see as a proxy, as a proxy to what can be done after because all of my work is predominantly aimed at designing technologies to help people changing their behaviors and usually changes in the behaviors are um, happening after they have changed something in their mind so attitudinal changes and maybe then answering the first question which was about which data sets so i pre like i am not a data scientist <laughs> first of all i'm more of a combination of behavioral scientists plus technology design and user experience and plus transformation. But then if I would need to imagine what kind of data sets would be interesting to look at so that to learn more about behavioral patterns. And I wouldn't be so much afraid from aggregate views on the pat different patterns that emerge in different parts of the world in a different urban context, for example, because that would be a good source for uh, drawing some interesting conclusions and especially deviations. So let me give you an example. So if you look, and I don't know what of the, which of those data sets are actually available or not available, <laughs> but then for example, if we have the access to the utilities and their data, water use, for example, or electricity use. That would be a one data set that municipalities would have. And if there is an access to that, we would be able to see the an anomalies into that data or different uh, deviations, depending on what kind of graduality to, of that data we would have. And if we see these deviations that would inform us whether people are following the suggested actions, and when we speak about washing your hands, that naturally, and if there is an increase in the water use over the time, that would be signaling of this behavioral pattern following the suggestion. And that means that they have the positive attitude towards washing their hands more often. And if not, if after this thing happened and we look at the utility data and it doesn't show any increase in the water use, then 
it's 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 signaling that there's something um, missing in the communication um, or in the communication or working actually people to change their minds. So that was just a one example. The other perspective. So this is more generic data. So data available and uh, first of all from the um, service companies like a public service companies like water and electricity and then then could be also more data sets that are specific to the COVID and I think when we start to speak about what kind of data would be more specifically helping with addressing the COVID-19 issues is about those behaviors or data sets that would be projecting those behaviors that directly is helping the virus to spread <laughs> and we would like to eliminate those that means spatial distancing and yes and the first one <laughs> washing your hands so the spatial distancing then would be what would be interesting to see and i don't know if those access to those data is available would be from not public data but that would be more from corporate where there are geolocated data about phones and again of course all of the issues about the privacy and the access to that that's a that's a that's a policy kind of thing and i don't want to go there but having that understanding whether people actually how they move or whether they stop moving and that would be naturally that's that data is accessible for the telecom operators at this point would be very good indicator for uh, their mobility patterns whether they've changed and whether there is some kind of indication that would inform that there is a problem so people are not having the right attitude and they are not following the best possible behaviors in the in the specific circumstances that we have right now those would be the most direct if there is an access to geolocated uh, moving of the phones <laughs> that would be like a, like one of those great layers to have uh, on, on this geography but i'm sure you have thought about that already and then maybe some proxies so what data sets could be serving as a proxy to explaining some of the behavioral dynamic and patterns in in the societies so i, I thought about some cities have bike share systems <laughs> and you know those are the systems that are tracking every bike from where they go uh, so they, they take it from the rack and they they drive somewhere and put it back so that's another interesting proxy to look how people have decreased the use and actually where are the most frequent movements in the urban space and not only bikes there are also these uh, lightweight scooters when you step one one feet on it and then you kind of use the other one or, or the electric ones those would be interesting data sets to look at and uh, see the activity and see the patterns behavioral patterns from from there and for example if there is a constant flow of this micro mobility to a certain location it, if, if, of course in this situation we would tell there is a high risk thing happening in one place where they, they are collecting so those would be interesting to look at and uh, maybe even further away proxy opportunity from my perspective I, I just thought about it is if we look at behaviors related with the internet use that's again comes down to whether we have access to that so first of all possibly there would be very generic view on whether there is an increase of internet use and certainly it, it kind of makes sense that from the home internet it has increased uh, into the demand so people may be watching movies or, or live streaming zoom like this that would be one indicator whether they actually stay at home <laughs> instead of moving around and then what would be even more interesting the tendency on how people downloading mobile apps and specifically you can imagine that people that are now isolated to some degree at home they are trying to figure out what to do with the time seeing the tendency of what kind of apps are downloaded from app store or from google play and seeing the tendencies of the increase of what kind of apps or what categories of apps and what specific um theme of the apps are becoming more popular for example there could be meditation apps there could be exercising at home apps um, 
I don't know, maybe some other good, like reading books, maybe people are downloading more books. So all of these perspectives just um, arrived to my mind when I was trying to think what kind of data sets and the different scales and from different perspectives uh, could be uh, as ideas uh, for you and for others to consider uh, into the effort to hunt down <laughs> behavioral patterns. And then of course, later when we will continue the, the conversation, I will explain why I'm so much into seeking ways to understand behaviors, human behaviors better from the data uh, science perspective. Oh, that's great, thank you very much. Um, and so a lot of your work, as you mentioned, focuses on that piece around changing populations behavior through feedback loops. Um, so what do you see in this current situation are some easy wins that things like this data analysis and being able to present that data to the public, what are some easy wins that we can be looking for in terms of changing behavior to be more healthy during COVID-19? Another great question. Um, easy wins. <laughs> so easy wins from my work has um, been so far ability to expose positive other similar people to the target audience. That's the magic recipe <laughs> for the success uh, at different scales. And therefore, you do the initial starting point, which is data. Data is essential for the loop. Otherwise, you cannot start <laughs> the loop because you don't have it. So raw data, uh, looking at the transforming framework that I give out as a master class, there is tool number five where you start designing a loop and the, the, the base layer is data. So this is what you're doing right now. And then the next layer is intelligence. Intelligent means you are figuring out the behavioral patterns and, and separate into three groups. Self-driven people, which means they are complying with all the good recommendations in this COVID time. And then there is red group, which is completely ignoring and you see it from the behavioral patterns. And then the third group is January 1st. They say yes, it's a, it's a bad time, I should do it, <laughs> but they, their behaviors show the opposite. And then based on this intelligence out of the dat raw data, we will be able to design the feedback loops with the understanding that if we are able in the unobtrusive way to project these well-performing people, and especially when we speak about geolocation and people are at homes and they, they kind of know their neighborhoods, through your data, layers would be able to project and people would be tapping in and saying, oh, how many people actually are <laughs> washing hands <laughs> in my building? And how many people are actually have increased this and decreased that? And, and it doesn't matter that much about being precise. It's about giving the taste. And the taste is so great influencer because social sciences have informed us. Every individual constantly change what they think and do based on others and that's uh, especially working for these January 1st people so we have the self-driven we expose those to the yellow ones and that's that's how the magic happens and why it's working I did recently another research study with them um, with the, my collaborator from Germany and we demystified the problem the long-standing problem why the link between information or knowledge to the behavior is broken. <laughs> it's not broken. It's just that there are two other elements in between that usually are neglected. And those elements are attitude and intention. So from information and knowledge, in this case, information and knowledge is it's pandemic. Virus is very sophisticated and very angry. <laughs> Next thing is accepting it as a part of your life. Some people are ignoring that. So, and then acceptance means, oh, I have to do something. Now, it's not, I have to, do, I, I'm accepting that this is now the change in my life and I need to do something about it. And the next is from the accepting, this is inevitable, this is here. And the next step is intention. Okay, I'm intending to act upon it. I need to readjust or change my life or change some of my routines and I need to commit for that. And only after that, you can get to the behavior. So if all of the effort is not put into this perspective, failure is there and we have seen some health campaigns at attracting or uh, targeting the red 
people, the very red people, the heavy smokers, for example, and then saying to them, smoking is bad. <laughs> and expecting they change. Of course, um, that's the recipe for failure. So therefore, in, instead of that, that could be a great knowledge to be used for easy wins. And maybe if there is a chance to have enough data geolocated with a positive behavioral examples, aggregated, enabling that as a platform for people to really be curious and like, I'm here. Okay, what people do about mobility? Oh, that decreased like this. So people actually not moving anywhere. Hmm. Oh, the water uh, consumption increased. Oh, that, that means they must washing their hands more often, okay. And you can even like give the easy way to break it down to a, a use per person and an increase what, how many times they are washing their hands more often. And, and again, it shouldn't be precise, but we would say, okay, now in your neighborhood, the washing frequency is 3.2 points, 3.2 uh, times more than previously. In the other neighborhood, it's just 2.8, and you feel good about it. Your neighborhood is, is better than the other one. And um, that could be one of the quickest data, data driven. And then, as a scientist, I would say if, if there is no kind of ready way to do that, uh, another alternative always is to run self-reported uh, surveys that's always uh, easy win <laughs> get the survey out and of course i or another scientist can help with what actual uh, attitudinal constructs would be important to measure and those would be usually related to perceived psychological discomfort or isolation or fear or the opposite, we would, we would um, survey something about whether people become more aware because of this lockdown kind of enables people to spend more self reflective time or people, some people get more dedication about their lives or more control over their lives or rethinking things. So that would be another easy quick win uh, that always is available and easy to, to run in terms of deploying as a, as a survey and also immediately reflecting that survey data in a, in, a, in a comprehensible way. So I would say those would be the two easy wins, at least that uh, I could think of <laughs> right now. Great, thanks so much. And uh, Arthur, uh, Arthur is our, uh, our founder at Corona Wine. You have a question that you'd wanna ask? Yes, quick question. So it sounds like you're, you're actually referring to how do we create an infrastructure that kind of actually a structure or guidance to bring the good in people and change their behaviors in an attempt to drive them away from easy things that they're currently indulging in terms of like, you know, watching Netflix and just like meaningless things that they're constantly doing and actually increasing the anxiety and increasing all the negative effects of, of our current society and the setup. Meanwhile, you know, we have this innate ability to emphasize the things that we naturally gravitate to. And this group is, is, is exactly that. Like we as humans, we love to collaborate. We want to be together. We want to help other humans. And this is our nature. This is our natural ability. So it really comes to kind of modeling that structure. Um, I'm not sure if many people are aware of the BJ Fogg uh, model of you know, changing behavior. Uh, that's, that's awesome that some people do. But basically, I'm going to share my screen here and ask you, like, how do we apply this model, which is basically finding a balance between things that are, you know, easy to do, um, hard to do, and having enough motivation to do these things. Because that's really, from my perspective, is the key. Finding that balance of figuring out the triggers that make it easy to engage in meaningful activities and having enough motivation and communicating that motivation to people. This is great work. I know personally BJ Fogg, we've met several times. There is still ongoing a conference called Persuasive Technology. Although I moved away from, I, I moved the persuasion out of the equation because that word is, has um, several meanings. Yes, and connotations, and not all of them are good. So <laughs> I moved away from persuasion and towards transformation. 
And by transformation, I mean sustainable change. So if, if, if you can have a, even incremental but sustainable directional change, that's a transformation. And speaking about B.J. Fogg's work, and of course he did his work at Stanford University, he still runs a behavioral design lab, which is great. And his new book, Tiny Habits, is out <laughs> about how people can self-help a lot. So he kind of he moved away from technology design and more into the self-help, which is also very, very important. And this uh, B.J. Fogg's model, behavioral model, is uh, also having the roots to the elaboration likelihood model of persuasion, where uh, there's two dimensions of attitude and environment. So easy to do and hard to do is in environmental factors and sometimes also personal, but then motivation is really the, your attitude, whether you are motivated or not motivated to do. And then this uh, line uh, in the graph says about uh, when your behaviors is happening, the behavior is happening above the line and not happening below. And also your prompts or the triggers to call for action are not success, successful be, below the curve and are successful above. So I, I spoke about, maybe I mentioned about my uh, work or at least the work how I frame the science for practice. It's a framework having eight tools. So you actually show the insights in the tool number two. <laughs> so I'm using it and I'm practically giving it out to, to people. But now coming down to your question, how to, what to do <laughs> if people are inclined to have fun, <laughs> hedonic <laughs> type of personalities, while the utilitarian kind of point of view would be more beneficial for themselves. My answer is quite simple and at the same time very effective, just like our human nature, curiosity. I think people got away from the, being curious uh, just by distraction and all of the opportunities that are out there easy to grab. And they were pushed culturally on them. We know the culture of consumerism and that's the driver of our cultural conditioning for far too long. And while this is so easy to get the joy, or as I refer to it, artificial happiness to some degree, uh, the curiosity has been diminished. And also sometimes even from what, how the kids are raised, <laughs> the curiosity is kind of damaged right there. Not always, but uh, there are some, sometimes that happens. So I would say, what would be really the, benefit of your work right now and referring to these multi-layered geographical opportunities for people to tap into that would be huge huge improvement for the curiosity and the driver for this kind of curiosity would be people are interested how other people do that's why they watch netflix they look how the other people do in their story <laughs> and then they reality shows for that so your work put into the nice, interactive, easy to comprehend way is the same thing, but it would be much more beneficial at this particular time, at the time of the COVID being the essence or influencer of the lives. So therefore I say recipe is getting people curious and through this curiosity, again, we can plug in into your, for example, your um, data visualization and this feedback loop some interesting influential design elements that would amplify that curiosity. And, you know, like a gamification kind of thing. The gamification is fundamentally based in the social psychology, the same social influence is just a fancy name that people use to make it more, again, attractive and curious uh, people for that. So there could be complementary elements that would make this curiosity not only stay within that person but also spread out to the other people and while they will be getting this experience i believe we could plug in some insights that would from the curiosity lead them to the awareness and the awareness about where is the source and the power of change and that's exactly, I think, what people are missing at this point. So they think the power is somewhere out there, <laughs> like they have been conditioned and used. Oh, you need to get fit 
oh, that means it implies you have to put some punishments on yourself and then you have, get, have, have to get some rewards. So if you get your body weight down to this level, then you go to Hawaii, <laughs> then you, you are allowed. And, and, and by the way, this is uh, one of the biggest delusions that all of this intrinsic stuff is sustainable. It's, it's, it's opposite. <laughs> Sustainability comes from within. <laughs> yeah, that, that's amazing. That's basically, yes, that is a framework, the curiosity, and we're definitely seeing it as a pattern here. And the reason why it keeps growing our community, we're almost at a thousand members. And I truly believe it's because people are curious and they're like, wait, what's going on in there? And we're, we're creating these tools empirically to, uh, you know, clickbait people into this, right? Like they, uh, for example, we have YouTube channel and we're following this radical transparency aspect that anyone can join any meeting, can join and see all the recordings of the meetings. And we started creating these timestamps for people to immediately see something curious, you know, hey, you're discussing this. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll check it out. So yeah, I'm, I'm hundred percent on that. I think one interesting thing in, in what you're describing also in terms of that, uh, that transformational piece, um, when you mentioned sort of seeing what your neighbors are doing, um, that, that there's this, this confluence of that curiosity piece of understanding what has impact and who's doing what. It brings in our, our competitive urges of like, oh, maybe, you know, I can, I can, I can be better than Joe down the hall and our, co and our cooperative ones as well of being able to say like, yeah, okay, our city is doing superbly. And I love this idea of being able to take that and move from an increasingly wide collective where that cooperative piece is to be able to say like, okay, it's our species. It's, you know, it's us versus COVID-19. Uh, and, and how do we boost our score? How do we win that? And so it's, it's fascinating looking at what are the ways we can use our data visualization and the data that we have access to, to encourage people to dive into that, explore it, um, and, and improve our score as a species. Wonderful. And uh, you, you just mentioned a few of the main social influence principles like competition <laughs> and learning, social learning, social competition. And there are five other ones that I work fundamentally for the last 10 years. Cooperation as well is there, recognition is there, social comparison, social norms, of course, and social facilitation. So those are the fundamental seven that I've spe specifically studied and that they can be plugged in. And I think uh, it's time to ask, uh, a question that I would like to ask <laughs> or what what's the question that you guys should be asking me is uh, and I have written it down <laughs> so how to help people efficiently achieving their desired transformations I think that's the major question because whatever outside circumstances come and this is one of the circumstances that came is how people can be ready with their power of change for whatever will be the next uh, outside um, circumstance. And again, what basically what a transformation this sense means, and especially for the COVID-19 is from being careless about it to be ca becoming careful. <laughs> from fearful about this, become cautious. And those are these attitudinal shifts and transformations that would be beneficial at the individual level and for the societies and for the global scale. So answering this question, <laughs> again, my experience and my scientific observations and my work has gotten me to the revelation which actually came out very recently. And I have written a blog post this morning uh, on my website and it's called activating transformation gene. I believe every human being in their DNA, and I'm speaking about not molecularly, but conceptually, has experienced, and there is accumulated knowledge about the changes and transformations that has happened over the thousands of years. And that knowledge is right there inside of us. We know what the change means, we know what the transformation means, and we have the power and energy to execute that anytime we want and anytime we are aware of we have that and this is kind of reflects back to the second question while people have been using the outside things and they always look for the outside help that's why medicine 
and pills. It's so easy <laughs> because, oh, that's the magic pill. I'm now, I, I don't need to do anything. <laughs> Because the inside of us, this transformation gene knows how you can pretty much do everything. It's just similarly as the all of the body does this, does the does its own work. So therefore, the best thing that you can do for people is to help them to navigate everyone to that place inside and uncover, unveil this transformation gene and activate it. After that, there is a new person with a new identity and with new understanding and the power of change that comes right from where it actually is possible. There is no other more sustainable way for a change that only from within, because that's a, that's, that works through, the, through our identity. And of course we can use best ways to leverage the interactions with the outside world, with the other people or with the other experiences and uh, to collect which of those experiences are helping to transform and which are not. So therefore, first of all, sentence number one, everything is already, you, you, have, you, you have already everything. <laughs> That's first awareness. And the more you create that understanding, the more you express the power of transformation the next you are make putting the awareness on your interactions with the world and then you become more aware which of those interactions are in line with your envision transformations and changes and which are actually uh, dragging you back to the comfort and not doing anything and then you refine those and then your awareness is growing into into the two areas yourself and the reaction with the world and the good thing is while people have this opportunity to do it themselves, naturally through the physical interactions we are mirroring. And what's good, good about the mirroring is we have that as well, <laughs> which means you become some, some, some expressing some other, like a new kind of behaviors to your friend. And the friend says, hmm, well, uh, even subconsciously, the friend would say, like think even, hmm, this is a new experience to me. And because that, other friend have that revelation it's not through, through the conscious cognitive intensive analyzing no it's because the dna in the other person just spoke up saying well you have it too <laughs> and that's the way how it spreads through the physical interactions i mean social interactions <laughs> even spatial <laughs> and then of course technology can be used to to amplify that so that would be the question that should be asked more often by everyone to everyone. <laughs> Makes sense. And I actually have a quick question on that. So I'm sure you're familiar with, with the work of Daniel Kahneman and the, the system one and system two. And essentially what, what we're talking about here is really that innate activation of, you know, concepts or things of prior knowledge that is encoded in us in terms of DNA and our evolutionary progress. And like, it, it really takes an effort, you know, there are biases, of course, to the system one, but there, there are also immense benefits. And just like, you know, you don't have to overthink it, you don't have to create some complex social structures to activate human potential, you just have to be human. Yes, coming back to what you have, uh, like, and, and, and kind of be aware of what distracts you from being, being the being. <laughs> and actually, be, like people say, okay, you have become doing instead of be like human doing instead of human being. And you very rightly said about Daniel Kahneman, uh, that's one of the ways how I also intertwine and explain the external motivators predominantly are designed for system two, which is intellectual rational. So you usually would reflect, oh, what's the reward? Oh, is it big enough or small enough? Will it, would I like to change my life because of this trip to Hawaii? Oh yes, like, that's a good like, one. Like how you talked about telling a smoker that smoking's bad for them. It's like rationally, all smokers know smoking's bad for them, but the rational part of it is irrelevant because of the habitual pattern recognition pattern building part of it that's built into their habits so strongly they have to work out how to undo the habit 
in small steps and small ways to re to to to, to stop it. You can't. There's no there's no intellectualizing bad things because it, it's not. It's like you, yeah, you can't explain people. You can't explain people to change their mind and to do to do better things for themselves. It's just absolutely ineffectual and inefficient, and it's never really worked. It work, never works in politics. It never works in academia. You can't you can't rationalize people's changes. You have to make them see the story of why that's important. They have to be, you have to be it has to make sense to them in a, in a more um, linguistic and a more of a story size sense of it. I find so it's got to it's got to it's got to work, and and also like an identity because so many people are wedded and bonded to the ideas of clans groups identities and some people are like i'm a smoker i like smoking it's that's it and it's trying to undo all of that complexity not just yeah don't do it it's bad for you it's, that's not that's never yeah. worked yet and that's also an important po point that ha has been raised across different you know tabex talks and others you know the simon sinek talks frequently about it it's not about what it's not about the complex structures or amazing like um, things that you build it's the why why are we doing certain things and why we as humans are attracted to it exactly and uh, reflecting just to what was said previously about this is more like uh, your own story so sometimes i explain this this kind of like dna concept speaks better to the people that are more exactly think, like thinking okay these are these genes you can um, have more gene expression here and less there through the epigenetics so those who are familiar with that but then when it comes to the simple language I, I i say that every person's identity is a book and then you just flip the pages and you get to the page which says your relationship with <laughs> smoking <laughs> and then on that page it's a sentence i do smoke but, or I am a smoker and then what essentially transformation means you are editing that sentence and most likely you are deleting that sentence altogether and then it disappears from your identity and then all of the questions of your previous friends and your acquaintances in the similar occasions just kind of say oh okay let's do as usual and and then you just have the book which doesn't have that sentence and then your question becomes irrelevant like it's, it's, it doesn't belong to me. Like it's, it's no, it's not even yes or no. It's just like irrelevant. Like the, the question doesn't require any answer. <laughs> so to some degree. I want to take a couple of moments to see if there's any other questions from the people who are on the call uh, that they'd like to, to sort of throw into the mix questions or insights that they want to put in. Well, maybe I mean, very this, quickly. This is... I... Oh yeah, go ahead, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, just uh, to answer some of uh, an implicit uh, question by Professor Steve before, um, we actually do have mobility data. It's uh, openly provided by Google, uh, not the raw data, but uh, there are mobility reports on various countries. You can find it easily on the internet if you're interested. It gives uh, quite interesting insights. That, that's great. Um, the beauty or the best possible alternative to this one, which is already better than nothing, is the instant, instant data. Of course, that's uh, something on the one hand we have, but then we might not have access to it <laughs> in most of the cases. Yes, exactly. But it's also, let's say, data that, that's complicated to use let's say i mean i don't think we would currently have the resources to do this kind of job because it's such a huge amount of data in in the background so it's, it would right. just be impossible for us i think to do the work that they did at google to just aggregating it and um extracting from it um, a meaningful metric mm -hmm. and, the, and what maybe the good thing is at least from my perspective as a behavioral scientist would, that I emphasized previously, like I would encourage you as a data scientist and people like doing the engineering around that, uh, you certainly need to do according to your standards, but then for getting something that would create a curiosity, it's not always necessary to have like a proper <laughs> background uh, thing, but it, it's enough that you, as crunching the data, you would capture something 
uh, interesting that would serve as a curiosity factor. And that sometimes could be just a slice of that, just as some interesting perspective and just feeding it back through the loops and then reamplifying through social influence, it would be just working well, even without like a very deep proper data science. So that's a, one of the easy quick wins that is always possible. That's wonderful. We're, before we wrap up, uh, we have a final uh, question. Anton, did you want to step in? Oh yeah, um, thanks for this, um, this insight. Professor's tip. Actually, it's it's very useful, and, and you know, I think that uh, the biggest part of this group is actually very interested in transforming behavior and habits, and overall the bigger uh, population of Earth. I would say, because we all see that um, whenever we are heading, it's it's a it's, it seems to be a dead end, like this consumerism and things and stuff like that. And uh, but definitely, we have to start from ourselves, right? We, we need to demonstrate success on ourselves. And uh, I was just wondering what to read next. I mean, uh, I was very much impressed with, with the materials. I'm reading a lot of things on this topic, but what, what's next? Uh, what, what would you recommend to start with in terms of uh, own personal behavioral change and transformation? And you're asking for um, readable items, <laughs> like books. Readable, <laughs> listenable, whatever. You know, I've, I've seen a couple of uh, TED Talks and uh, YouTube videos with you. Uh, maybe there are some readable or I don't know. That's the most frequent question in my talks. Where is your book? <laughs> <laughs> and an honest answer is, if I look back, what was, what, was, what was my work a year ago? It wasn't anything like this. And knowing the cycle of the book, oh, it's, it's, it doesn't have fit. Because the work that uh, the, the the pace of the work and the, the the trajectory is such a fast pace that I I mm -hmm. would rather and what I do I, and I'm committed right now to put out more blog posts more videos and um, I've captured an easy and interesting way how I can do more of that more frequently because I'm giving these kind of talks and I could just plug in my video cam and, and capture this and get it out like on a frequent basis. And people, I think nowadays enjoy this luxury of audio visual. Mm -hmm. And that also communicates all of this DNA thing. <laughs> it speaks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> through the cam. So I would sound possibly very egocentric at this moment. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> you can imagine, I could say, transforms.me <laughs> that would be the platform and then from there you can go to the research literature which of course comes out after a six months or or, or year or two or the videos right um, right now and um, I encourage to look at the other work of course because uh, that's the best way how people can filter out what works for them best for example when I look at uh, people speaking about mindfulness and awareness and consciousness there are great speakers and there are many of them and some people prefer one so the other people prefer uh, the other one but for the at least one a source of inspiration that would be my recommendation to just go on transforms.me and, and see see what's coming up there okay and your, I'm assuming that your uh, YouTube channel will be quite frequently updated, right? Based on your, what you say. Exactly. That's cool. really a, now a public commitment. And that was something I realized two days ago. Mm -hmm. Instead of, and, and by the way, I can tell you one trick. So sometimes people sit down and they kind of get themselves ready and then they video record. And then it's not natural. Instead, if this is a conversation, then our DNA speaks in a natural human interaction. Mm. And then that output resonates with the listeners much better. I've seen myself from a side yeah, when I'm just like, like act, acting and yeah. now. As, as someone who interacts with uh, full-time streamers a lot, and I've been on a lot of different streams for a long time. Thank you. Conversa conversational discussions are much more interesting than someone just parking and talking at something it can be interesting i love i love a good podcast i'm a massive consumer of audio and video all, all of the podcasts all of the time but yeah there's there is something to be said for an interesting discussion with different points of view absolutely in a different it moves in a different way i've i i've always really enjoyed like podcasts that are interviews because 
even the interviewer can't know where it's going to end up and it ends up in a much especially a good interviewer can bring out questions that they didn't even think to at the beginning and then they can keep a conversation going and it ends up with a much more interesting naturally organic discussion piece and it's just i've always found that a much more interesting way of doing it i mean that's one of the reasons why there's like i interact with a, um, a gaming community who are 24 7 there's always a streamer on so if i feel like having a chat with someone i could just drop in and talk and we could talk about games but we'll talk because you you do eight hours of streaming a particular game eventually you're just going to not talk about the game anymore and you'll just talk about anything and everything and it's one of the weird things that over like last decade i've picked up the ability to just join a conversation and talk and and talk and talk and talk about whatever whatever's being discussed and it's an interesting way but yeah but but there's like you can't you can the side effect of that is like every now and then i will go to bed because a really interesting topics come up and i'm like it's 5 a.m but this is i can't walk away from this because it's too interesting even if it's just like three other people talking i'm like i'm just i'm just just stuck in i can't not i can't walk away from it the same as it's happening right now. We actually have exactly. a daily poll today at 10 uh, my time, and we're already four minutes into it. So we are already I'll, late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this is exciting. So um, I would yeah. just say, yeah, Daniel, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time. It's a, it's a really real delight to, to hear your thoughts. I look forward to further, further interactions and getting your ideas around, around how we can, can do all of this. And uh, yeah, so anyone who's wanting, who's watching this afterwards and wants to find out a little bit more uh, about uh, Professor Stive's work, transforms.me is the place to go. Anyone who's interested in what we're up to here at Corona Y, come by coronay.org. That's coronawhy.org. Um, and you can find out what we're up to, or even better, you can come and join us and, uh, and, and help with things. So thanks again. Uh, I, ex I expect visits from the professor, even if it's just out of curiosity to see what we're doing on some calls. Perfect. Exactly. All right. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, guys. Bye, everyone. Right. Thanks. Good luck with everything. Bye.